Well, good morning. You know, over the last few weeks, we've been doing a sermon series based on the books of the Minor Prophets. Now, these Old Testament books are collectively known as the Minor Prophets, not because they're of less importance or because what the prophets say and do is insignificant in comparison to the words and actions of the biggies like Isaiah and Jeremiah. The use of minor prophet has to do with the short length of the book. All of the prophets have something to say that we need to hear. Now the other thing that's been happening in connection with this sermon series is the challenge to prove the best book of the minor prophets. Now, Pastor Jennifer started it with a bold declaration that Jonah is the best book. And then Pastor Philip had to ramp it up a notch by saying that Micah is so good that he named his son after the prophet. And then there's Pastor Max. Pastor Max said that although his son was not named after a minor prophet, he had considered asking his wife to change her name to Gomer. <laughs> now, Gomer is the prophet Hosea's wife, and her reputation is just a wee bit tarnished. So obviously, Max in his wisdom did not make that request of Kristen because he is alive and well and here today. <laughs> now, all three of them, all three of my supposed friends and clergy colleagues have been throwing shade at me. They've been sh throwing shade at me about preaching Habakkuk. It was suggested that in order to convince you that Habakkuk is by far the best minor prophet, I would claim that one of my children is named in honor of him. I will be honest with you. That is a challenge to my integrity. And I'm going to clarify it right now. Um, is there a picture? It's a picture of my children. Ah, there you go. Now, these are my, my children. In the top picture, that's my son, Charles Newton McCurdy II. And with him is his beautiful wife and the world's best daughter-in-law, Lisa Ruth Gabrielson McCurdy. And then down in the lower corner, there's my sweet baby girl, Britt. Her name is Britton Mahan McCurdy Sperry. And beside her is indeed the world's best son-in-law, her husband, Will Carson Sperry. And then, of course, there is the world's most beautiful perfect, about-to-turn-one-year-old granddaughter, Cameron Allison McCurdy. Those are their legal names. <laughs> there is not a prophet in the bunch. I'm going to be real honest with you. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to give the gentle hint that Habakkuk is a stellar name for my next grandchild. I mean, after all. <laughs> After all, who doesn't want to name their child after the best minor prophet? Habakkuk. <laughs> but before we go on to the book of Habakkuk, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the book of Habakkuk gives no details about the prophet. 
There's no mention of where Habakkuk lives, what he does for a living, or who is king at the time. The book begins with an oracle. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. That's it for the intro. Jewish tradition identifies Habakkuk as a Levite. And Habakkuk appears in an addition to the story of Daniel, entitled Bell and the Dragon. A commentary on the prophet was used by the ancient Qumran community as it was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Apostle Paul quotes Habakkuk three times, three times in his writings on justification by faith. And the contents of the book of Habakkuk point to it being set between 605 BCE and 5087 BCE, which is the time period of the Chaldean, our early Babylonian empire, increasing in power and size and eventually invading and conquering Judah. Those are the stats on Habakkuk. If you read the book, unlike most prophetic books, Habakkuk does not confront the people on God's behalf. Habakkuk confronts God. And there is no polite, uh, excuse me, Lord, I have a couple of questions for you. Do you mind answering them? Oh, no. Habakkuk has a complaint against God, and it is full steam ahead with lodging it. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? It's a question and an accusation. And since the prophet is already pointing fingers at God, he continues with, why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Angry, confused, frustrated are just a few words that can be used to describe Habakkuk's emotions. He has witnessed wicked people perpetrate all manner of injustice in Judah and get away with it. There's no adherence to the Torah, so there's no order. Society is in chaos and confusion reigns. And God doesn't doesn't seem to care. Because God is not responding to the prophet's cries for help. Now I'm going to have to pause and let you know that Habakkuk's in-your-face attitude with God tends to make me a little uncomfortable. My early childhood was spent in another denomination where it was deemed unacceptable to question or express anger towards God. It was sinful and and showed a lack of trust in God. You know, I, I called my sister Melinda and was talking to her about, God, this lingering notion. And she shared with me that she... She felt the same way. It wasn't an overt teaching of the denomination. It was just something that you sensed within your bones. And so as we talked, she and I admitted that we were working through that notion and that we were grateful to be in spaces where we could ask our questions, express our emotions, and know for certain that God's love for us is not at risk. 
Beloved, we can come to God with all of our stuff, our mess, our trouble. You see, God can handle our, our anger, anxiety, confusion, doubt, and our questions. We can be honest with God. And like the prophet Habakkuk, we can be persistent. In the same conversation with my sister, she shared how our auntie said that she often prayed like God had no clue about what was going on in her world. She poured out her emotions and reminded God of her needs and God's promises. She trusted that God was present, or why pray at all? Auntie wanted God to know that she felt like God was not truly listening, but she still believed in God's presence. Habakkuk seems to have that same mindset. He continues his lament until God responds. Pamela Cooper White writes in a commentary on Habakkuk, what gives him the persistence, even the chutzpah, the nerve to confront God? The paradox of lament is that there is no lament without a foundation of faith. Grief, sorrow, despair exist alongside a void of faith. But argumentative lament presupposes that someone, capital S, is listening. Close quote. So Habakkuk boldly cries out, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? And why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? The echoes of those cry have been heard across the history of our world. It's shouted by enslaved people everywhere. It rings out from humans herded into concentration camps and detention centers. It is declared by those caught up in the middle of war and violence and exclaimed by the poor and the outcast. And it is sounded, it is sounded everywhere Wherever systems of oppression are legalized, institutionalized, and thus normalized. The lament or cries, how long and why, are heard because injustice in all its insidious forms flourishes. Injustice is not our God's doing. It is the result of human choices. It is the result of human action or human inaction. And oh, laments, they go up. They are heard from individuals who endure the pain of sickness and loss and grief. The lament is cried out in desperation and with a heart's longing for help and wholeness. God, how long will this pain last? God, why am I suffering? What did I do? God answers the prophet. 
God tells Habakkuk, look at the nations and see. God will act in God's time and in God's way. The injustice in Judah will end and they will reap the results of their actions. Judah will be invaded and conquered by the Chaldean army as they sweep through the region and establish their empire. Judah will know injustice as they experience the violence and the brutality of war and live under oppressive rule. Habakkuk has to answer that. So in round two of his lament, the prophet inquires why God is using an enemy of God's people to end injustice in Judah. The Chaldeans are far worse than the Judeans. They have no sense of justice and they value the lives of others even less. The Chaldeans treat conquered people no better than fish caught in a net. They are treated like a commodity to be consumed. I think this is where we have to say it is okay to admit that sometimes the working of God is hard to understand. Because we want God to work by our plan and on our timetable. But God works in ways we cannot Imagine with our finite minds. You see, God has the biggest picture of creation and redemption, and it is a picture of the past, present, and future. And God's activity to bring restoration is woven throughout it. The thing for us to hold on to is that God is loving and faithful. Our circumstances change, but God's character does not. The prophet anticipates that, that God is going to respond to his second lament, so he readies himself. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. God replies and tells Habakkuk to write a vision down so that it is preserved for the time when it is fulfilled. And God goes on to say that if the fulfillment of the vision seems to tarry, or delayed, the prophet is to wait for it because it will not be delayed. Although waiting is really hard, the fulfillment of the vision will be right on time because God is in control and God's timing is the perfect. The proud those who gain wealth by deceitful means, the arrogant, those who are oppressive and unjust, and those who put their confidence in their own power and might. All of these will be dealt with by God. The choices they make lead to their eventual downfall. God's justice will catch up with them. And God goes on to tell Habakkuk that the righteous will live by faith. The righteous put their trust in God. They believe God is who God claims to be. The righteous remember. They remember the loving activity of God in the past and they put their confidence in God in the present and for their future. And in the midst of struggle, the righteous rely on the faithfulness of God. They seek God's presence and they seek God's guidance on how to journey through challenging times 
and how to do that in a manner that honors God. You know, over the past couple of months, in the midst of our denomination's challenging times, I have been more than grateful for the leadership that through their word and their witness remind me of God's faithfulness. Our bishops acknowledge that, that change has occurred. But they remind us that the church's mission of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ has not and will never change. And so they continue to encourage clergy and laity to keep our eyes focused, our minds alert, and our hearts open to where God is at work in us and around us. Because our good God is always working. And the bishops remind us that even in the season of struggle and strife, the love and grace and mercy of God is constant. And we can place our trust on that truth. Toward the end of the book of Habakkuk, something within the prophet causes him to shift from a lament to acknowledgement of God's that he can trust God. Was it that the prophet felt the emotional release that we all feel when we voice a complaint? Was he happy that God finally responded and has a plan to restore justice in Judea? Did he remember? Did he remember that God is God and there is no other? Did those memories of God's acts of faithfulness flood Habakkuk's mind? Do they remind him that even when wrongdoing and trouble are all around us, God's love, grace, and mercy are constant. Something within the prophet did shift because his prayer ends with these words found in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vine, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Oh, how Habakkuk speaks to us today. Our world feels chaotic because it is chaotic. Fear is rampant, and the after effect of fear is hatred. And hatred results in all the woes of our world. It is apparent in the violence of our world. And it's seen and experienced in the division among the people of this nation. And it is evident in the acts of greed and prejudice and intolerance and injustice that occur all around us. We cry out, how long? We cry out for ourselves. We cry out for the world. And I hope we cry out how long for those who have no voice.
Do we have confidence that God hears our lament? Do we put our faith in God and trust in God's divine activity? Do we allow our memories of God's love and faithfulness to strengthen our trust and our hope? Do we hold on to the experience of encountering the beautiful, restorative grace of Jesus Christ? Author Sarah Bessie writes, when we suffer, when we are bruised and scarred, when our light has been blown out, when we are ground beneath someone else's feet, I hope to remember we belong to a God who is faithful to restore us. Close quote. Beloved, do we stand at the watch post and wait expectantly for God's response? Oh, we, we can't ignore the suffering and injustice happening around us because to do that is to allow it to continue. But we can do this. We can open up ourselves to the love of God we can open up ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit and how God is calling to us and inviting us to join God in a work of healing and restoration. Habakkuk, the best prophet, reminds us that our source of salvation and strength is God. Hear the good news. God loves you. God is faithful. God is active. God fulfills God's promise. He has not, nor will he ever, leave us or forsake us. God is trustworthy. So may we turn to and grab hold of this faith as we journey through life and navigate its joys and its sorrows. May it encourage and inspire us to live in love and act with compassion. May it bring us comfort and peace. And may this continue to be our source of hope. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to trust in you at all times and to remember that you are always working for the restoration of the world that belongs to you. Help us to cling to our belief and our experience of you as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.